Sue, I'm John. John? Katie. Katie. And Katie, Yes. Okay, so once again, everybody, welcome to Bambalella. My name's Sue, Lucy, Sergio, the photographer. Um, let me talk a little bit about baboons first. Easter this year, we, we released, three years ago, Easter this year, we released an expat female baboon into the wild troop. She'd spent at least eight years in captivity. Now, it's very easy with males, because male monkeys, male baboons transfer. But females generally stick with the troop that they're born to. However, we felt it was worth a try, because otherwise she was going to spend the rest of her life in a cage, either on her own or with her companion. And as they can live for up to 30 years in captivity, we felt that wasn't a very good idea. Her name's Suki, and she's been living free pretty much ever since. April the year before last, we heard about a little male baboon. We called him Merlin. Uh, his mum was electrocuted. We picked him up just the other side of Nastrum. And since Suki hadn't got pregnant during all the time that she'd been free, Silka thought it would be a nice idea to use Suki to help rear Merlin and then ease his transition into the wild troop. Obviously, we still had to hand rear Merlin because she didn't have milk. So Suki and Merlin were walking with the troop sometimes, but spending a lot of time here, which was what we needed because we had to monitor Merlin's health and weight. A few months down the line, we got another female in. Older than Merlin, not so cute, so we didn't want to adopt him. We had to hand rear Tondi. And then October, the year before last, we heard about a three-year-old uh, female baboon that had spent the first three years of her life in a township where they taught her tricks. Um, when she wasn't performing tricks, they put a harness on her and they chained her up. Her name is Julie. She was confiscated by Nature Conservation, but they took her to a lodge that was had lots of wildlife permits, but not a great deal of knowledge about baboons. They didn't want to put Julie in a cage. They thought it would be smart to put a collar on her, attach it to a chain and walk her around the property. Back in 2003, Silke von Einer, who'd lived in this area of the Waterberg for many, many years, decided to buy herself some wildlife because there wasn't anything here. Now, the first animals she bought were five blue wildebeest, but when they arrived here, she realized they were too young to have been taken away from their mums. She got in touch with Brian Jones, who runs Mahola Holo Rehabilitation Center just outside of Sprite, and Brian gave her instructions as to how to handle those animals. Sadly, she lost one the first evening but the remaining four were successfully hand-reared and put out into the bush where they belong. That's Suki. She will not give you any problems whatsoever. She's got the best of both worlds. She can be with baboons if she wants to be with baboons, or she can chill out around here. <laughs> Don't make a liar out of me now, Suits. <laughs> She's also just coming into season at the moment. That's what the pink on the bum is. There's nothing wrong with her. She's not ill. It's natural. And the bigger that is, the brighter it is, the more attractive it is to the male baboon. So going back to Silka. Brian sent other orphaned and injured animals here, and local people heard about Silka's new passion. She's raised everything from the smallest little meerkat or mongoose baby, right up to a rhino and a giraffe baby. Pretty much everything else in between. Two years after she started, she got a phone call from the nearby town and the people's neighbours had moved out, leaving behind their pet monkey in a cage without food and without water. That monkey came here, followed by others. Now, baby vervets, unlike baby baboons, are born in a season. The season generally runs from September through to January, February time. <coughs> but we call both of them pink faces when they're born because they are pink in the face, the ears, the hands and the feet. You are going to meet one. You are going to spend some time with them. You're going to see just how cute, how adorable, and how naughty they can be. <laughs> Silka fell in love with the species, and she decided she'd concentrate primarily on the vervet monkey. Since then, she's put 15 troops back into the wild. That's close to 400 monkeys that have been rescued, rehabilitated, and then released back into their natural habitat where they belong. We go to private game farms within the province, um, but we don't go to South African national parks because their method of dealing with any problem animals is just to shoot them. And people are always going to feed monkeys and baboons, sadly. So around picnic sites, around campsites, they would become a nuisance and therefore our monkeys wouldn't survive. So we look for privately owned game farms in the area um, that are monkey friendly. So how do we pay for it? You guys. <laughs> 
thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Money that you've paid and the product donation will go directly towards helping the monkeys. We take in volunteers from all over the world. If you look at volunteering in the future, you'll find it's very, very expensive. Most people will book through an agent and those agents will take a huge chunk of your money for their commission. The rest of the money that you pay is not just to cover your food and accommodation. There's a small amount there to help the project that you're volunteering at. Whatever the project, wherever it is. So my advice to anybody that is thinking about volunteering is use those websites, have a look and see what's out there. See what it is that really touches your heart. And then see if you can't do some research, contact the project direct, if you can book direct, it is going to be cheaper for you, but you also know that all of the money that you pay is going to the project that you want to volunteer at anyway. Finally, we run a guardian angel program whereby you can adopt one of the monkeys on the farm. Now, it doesn't mean you can take it home to the States with you. <laughs> monkeys really don't make good pets, but for your monthly contribution, initially we'll give you a certificate with pictures of you, pictures of the monkey that you've chosen, and we'll do a little write-up of the background of that monkey and how it came here to Bambolella. Every month that you subscribe, you'll get via email a photo of your monkey and an update of what's happening. If there's something specific to your monkey, we will tell you. So if it's sick or injured, we'll let you know. We'll update you the following month. If it's female, has a baby, makes you a granddad or a grandma, we'll tell you. Obviously, if it goes out on release, we are going to tell you, but we hope you're still going to support your monkey for the next two or three months because we're going to be out in the field supporting it as they make the transition from being in a cage and fed to being out there in their natural habitat and foraging for their own food. Sadly, not every monkey that comes through the front gates does make it all the way through rehabilitation. If your monkey dies, we'll tell you as much as we can about the circumstances of its death. We then don't expect you to pay anymore because all of the money from our guardian angels goes towards buying food for the monkeys. We don't spend it on anything else. I mean, we're living in the bush. We've got venomous snakes and venomous spiders. They do take their toll on the monkeys. It could be that your monkey comes in with an underlying condition that we're totally unaware of. First year I was here, we got a little pink face in who was rescued from a bar. Her name was Venna. She was hand reared. She was put into rehab the following year. But the next winter, she caught the flu and that very quickly developed into pneumonia. Now, despite getting the right antibiotics, she was dead within 48 hours, and we wanted to know why. So we opened her up. Her little lungs were black. If she had 50% lung capacity, that's about all she had. Not something we could have foreseen. If we had foreseen it, nothing we could have done about it. But it just demonstrates that if one of our monkeys dies, we are going to investigate, because they were all our babies at some point. Or alternatively, they've come in as somebody's unwanted pet, and we've taken the time to socialise them with other monkeys to get them into troops. We care about each and every one of the monkeys on this farm. So if your monkey dies, we will tell you. Won't just keep taking your money, send in your random photographs. Um, Bambalela, it's from the Zulu, and it means to hold on. Okay, we spoke a little bit about the baboons. Otherwise, safety, don't put your fingers through the cages. Monkeys and baboons are omnivores, which means they like a percentage of meat in their diet, and we don't have the funds to feed the meat very often. Do you have monkeys as pets no. in that state? No. <laughs> as in many states, it still is. This. Um, we have used this as a rehabilitation cage. Every monkey that comes in to the farm has lost its family along the way we have to give them new families so that we can put them back into the wild. Now in the case of the ex-pets, we put them together in very small groups so that they can learn to socialise. Because if they've spent all their time with people, they don't know how to behave as monkeys. Then we'll start adding juveniles because that makes them play a little bit more and that helps any psychological problems up here. Helps heal them. Finally, we'll look at those small groups and we'll think, hey, okay, you guys are looking and acting like monkeys. Let's put you together, let's put you in a rehab cage, and let's see how you get on with that one. There will be fighting initially, um, because the males have got to work out who's going to be dominant male, females have got to work out who's going to be dominant, but they will settle down. Once we put them in rehab, they're going to spend minimum of three years there, because when we first put those groups together, they're not family. We don't stop our females from having babies. Some of them are rescues from Sangomas, 
you know what Sango knows? Mm -hmm. Anatomy and witch doctor. So we need to know, because the females will spend their lives with the two, that at least some of those females can have babies. But it doesn't help if they're pushing babies out every season, if they then neglect them. So it shows us that some can have babies, and it shows us that they can care for their babies. But the biggest thing of all is it starts to build family bonds within the troop. The female vervet doesn't want to carry her baby 24-7. She wants a babysitter. And in that first season, she's going to use another female that she feels close to. So it will strengthen the bonds between those females, but also between the babysitter and the baby. The males will be protective because they think the babies are theirs. And the juveniles will want to play with those babies because that's what big brothers and big sisters do. So you can imagine over the course of three years or so, we've got three seasons of babies. We've got an awful lot of bonds within that troop. The last troop we took out had 11 babies. Those babies will grow up in freedom, but they're also part of the glue that is going to make that troop stick together. Yes, we're going to lose some of the males. It's their time to move on to put pastures new, to, <laughs> bush, uh, to look for new troops. But we're still going to have males, females, subadults, juveniles, and the babies. That's the troop that we're going to monitor. It's a long process, but if we take them out too soon and they don't stick together, they're not going to survive because their safety depends on their numbers and looking out for each other. And these non human primates. <laughs> Who have we got today? Princess Anastasia. She was, okay. she was left behind by a troop. Now that can sometimes happen if there's been a drought, as there was this year. Mum's weak, having carried the baby. Baby's weak after birth. Troop gets a fright. Baby can't hang on. Very sad. Now the reason we bring the one out is so you can see the similarities between us human primates and this non-human primate. She is 92% the same DNA as us and as such we've got lots of things in common. The baboon incidentally is 94%. Caitlin's going to show you, feel free to take pictures, feel free to touch her. They've got five digit hands and feet with little thin nails. You have little your toe hands, nails. I can just show them. And if you look <laughs> really, really, really closely, You'll see they've got tiny little fingerprints. Or toe prints. They have opposable thumbs, just like us. And better than us, they have opposable yeah, toes. Yeah, that's my fingers. When the little baby vervet or baby baboon is born, they have to be able to hold on to their mum. Oh, there you go. Uh, she will support them in the first few days. Stop it now. However, if she's got to run from danger, yeah. they have to be able to hold on. Little passage, just like us. So they do suffer a little bit from the loss of sense of smell. However, they're using their senses the whole time. <laughs> so all of their senses are a lot sharper than ours are. It's okay, it's just Suki. It's just Suki. Just because Suki's climbed up. <laughs> Well, she's possibly feeling a little bit nervous, and that's why she's come close to us. For the dominance. All male baboons out, outrank female baboons. Um, and we've got two or three troops that visit us, and some one troop she's much more comfortable around than the others. <laughs> yeah. So the eyes are centrally positioned in the head, which means they've got the same 3D binocular vision that we've got. Mammals have got their eyes here, see everything flat. Everything is two-dimensional to them. And all primates, just like birds, see in colour. A little bit nervous. And those of us that they know really well, we're part of their comfort zone. Mm. So that was a wild one. No, yeah. that was Tony that came to me because she got a fright from one of those. Uh. If you have a look, Silk has got Merlin in her arms just now. Um, but Suki's still around, so she's not too upset, otherwise she'd be long gone. Because she obviously knows the wild troop a lot better than any of the others. Mm. That's Silk. In our kindergarten, we have females that we know we can't release. Majuma was hit by a car and she's virtually blind. Hola. 
was, uh, when she was confiscated, they found her in a little parrot cage. And as a fully grown monkey, all she could do was walk round and round in circles. Mm. You can't imagine how much that messes with your head. But when she gets upset, she starts that same kind of repetitive behaviour again. So we know we can't release her. But as we introduce the babies in here, those females will help socialise them more. They'll discipline them. They'll teach them manners. But the biggest thing of all is they're going to form bonds with our babies. To the extent that when we come to fetch them in for nappy hour, they're not going to want to come for us in the days of the night time. They'd rather sleep outside with a surrogate monkey mum than inside with a human foster mum and dad. Can live for up to 30 years in captivity. Surely there's lots and lots of monkeys out there. Numbers of monkeys and baboons are in decline, primarily down to the loss of their habitat. We're squeezing them into smaller and smaller spaces. Okay. Well, it's like all of South Africa's wildlife, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's all threatened. But because they're primates, they tend to be a lot more intelligent, uh, a lot more innovative, and they become a pest to us, albeit we invaded their home first. Now, these monkeys in here, are not in here because they're elderly, although they're all well into their 20s. <clears throat> they're here because they were pets for many, many years and they were fed a diet very high in sugar. As such, most of them have only got two or three teeth left. They're not going to be able to feed themselves in the wild and they can't defend themselves in the wild. So, they're not going to survive. It's not a matter of their age, it's the physical condition. Silka has sent two troops out, one had an 18-year-old in, one had a 22-year-old in. So it's not their age, it's their ability to survive. In the wild, they've got a life expectancy somewhere between 15 and 20 years. But we'd rather give a monkey a couple of years of freedom than stick him in a cage for the next 10. So this is a rest home for grumpy old men and women. <laughs> if you look at Rambo, you'll see his face is lighter, his coloration is different. Uh, he's a subspecies of vervet monkey. He comes from further north in Africa. <laughs> hey, stop it, Larry. <laughs> These do it not because they're actually trying to intimidate you. They were pets. They just got a few weird behavioral issues. <laughs> the cage next door is our handicap camp. Her name's Lucy. She came to us um, getting on for about two and a half months ago now. She was hit by a car and when she arrived here it was seem she was seemingly paralyzed from the waist down. But if you watch you can see that she's now using both legs and the tail. Um, the improvement in her was quite dramatic, really. Uh, but there was a few weeks when she wasn't using those legs and of course the muscles, the tendons, everything's a trophy. Mm. But you can see that she can move around mm. quite well now. So she needs a little bit more time to recover from the nerve damage of being hit by the car. Every possibility that Lucy can go into a rehab troop and go back into the wild where she belongs. somebody else that's got an interesting story. I think the male will be in the room here. I can't see if it's um, a barrel or not. How much you're all hiding up in the corner? <laughs> Right in the back corner, you can barely see him. Back right hand corner, uh, that's Kingsley. One eye was totally inoperable. The other one, they replaced the lens, but it seems as though all Kingsley can see is either shadows or very close to. So he's gonna be a long-term resident.
Monkey sitting up there is Upstart and he has epilepsy from severe head trauma. Now because they're 92% the same DNA as us, he gets epilin syrup three times a day. Same as a human would. Hmm. Or one of the drugs that they give to humans. Controls his fits, but it doesn't totally stop them. Oh, there's Cribble Cursey. He was hit by a car, lost the arm, but you can see his right knee is very, very badly damaged. We have to assess him for a little bit longer to see whether he's going to be able to cope in the wild or not, because the damage to his knee is quite extensive. Wherever possible, if we can release, we will do. But for the most part, the monkeys in here are mentally handicapped, blind or partially sighted, or severely physically handicapped. So we just offer them a safe haven and the company of their own kind. Okay, so these are the main rehab cages, and as you can see, they're nice and big. If you take a look inside, you'll see there's an awful lot of things in there that move. The tires, the ladders, the platforms, hammocks, hose pipes. <laughs> Most of the monkeys here have been hand reared, and not all of them by us. And it's sad to say that we get monkeys that arrive at Bambalella that have been kept in such tiny cages they don't even know how to climb. And for a monkey that's going to spend a good proportion of its life in the trees, it's kind of sad, isn't it? So once they go into a rehab cage, we have to give them the time and the opportunity to develop the skills they're going to need out of the bush. Balance, agility, muscle tone, strength. And the confidence to know that if they want to jump from one place to another, they do it instinctively. Because if they're running from danger, there's no time for them to stop and think about it. So that's why the cages are constructed as they are. This is Orphican's troop. She's the dominant female. She was the one that used to bite herself down to the bone. This is the second rehab troop we put her in. The first one didn't work out, so we put her back in kindergarten for another two years. Now she's in here. And hopefully next season, if we can get the release permit and the right release site, this troop will go outside. So there's hope for all of them. Now because of their entertainment value and their ecological benefits, we are fortunate in that there are landowners out there that want monkeys on the property. The first thing Silka will do is go out there, survey the land, make sure there's all the right vegetation there, and if everything looks good, she'll apply from the permits that we need from Nature Conservation to take the monkeys out. Once we've got those permits, she's going to go back out to the release site with a team of people. We're going to build the monkeys a temporary cage. We're only going to keep them in there for a week. But it's important that we do that so that they can get to know their new home. So they can get used to the wildlife that's in that area that they may not have seen before. The last release that we did, they've got a herd of buffalo. So you can imagine if we took a troop of monkeys out, drop them off in the middle of nowhere, herd of buffalo comes marching through, they're going to freak out. They could disappear in all directions. And they are going to struggle to find each other because they don't know the area. So that's the purpose of the temple cage. Now all we've got to do is get them out there. The only people that enter these cages now is the main caretaker and his deputy. For the rest of us, it's hands off. Babies or no babies. They've got their own families now. So early on the morning of the release, the caretaker will come to his cage. He's going to take out all of the old food, and then we're going to set traps for the monkeys. Put all their favorite foods in there. As they walk into the trap, the gate closes behind them. We can safely carry them out of the cage. We'll take them to the quarantine camp, which is where you're going to do your interaction shortly. Vaccinate them again against pet for our last opportunity. Put them into their travel cages. Now we can give them as much food and as much water as they desire. And very often we give them rescue to help calm them down. Because it is a stressful time for them. We're coming up to the mating season now as well. Even more hormones. They just wean their babies and then they start all over again. We wait until they've caught, we've got the whole troop. Once we've got all of the monkeys, that's when we start loading them up onto the bucky and trailer. See, they are getting quite independent, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> that one's got some blue balls that are like brighter than the tire. Yep. 
<laughs> and that's a baby. Not too close, otherwise they will grab you. <laughs> Even the little ones will try. Caretaker's going to travel with his troop, mm. as will a driver, so we've got two people out in the field. We'll keep them in that temporary cage for seven days so that they can get used to their new surroundings. And they'll have the same routine as they have here at Bambalella. So they'll get fed twice a day, the water will be changed as often as they tip it over. Once we open them up, if they get a fright, they should be able to find their way back because they've had an opportunity to orientate themselves, to pick out some landmarks, and it's also been a source of food. Some of the males are going to transfer. It's their time to move on. There's nothing we can do about that. However, we're going to be left with males, females, sub-adults, juveniles, and babies. That's what we're going to be monitoring. As time goes by, we'll start to break down bits of the camp. We don't take it all away at once. And as we're getting ready to leave them alone for the first 24 hours, we'll set trap cameras up around the release site so that we can keep an eye on what they're up to. As long as we see images on those media cards, we don't have to see monkeys because we know they're okay. In the past, if we didn't see monkeys for two or three visits, we'd go looking for them. So having the trap cameras mean we impact much less on their new life of freedom. Once in a while, we may find that one of the monkeys heads off towards human habitation. That monkey will come back and walk back to the release site. He tries it again, they come back to the back of the river. We're not going to let one monkey drag down the rest of the troop. Two troop releases last season, 80-something monkeys, we brought one monkey back. So it is a small number, but it's something we have to be aware of, because remember, most of them have been hand-reared. And although they seem to be acting like a normal troop, sticking together, everything else, it may well be that the one is just not ready for life in the bush. Come, come, come. <laughs>